<laughs> it's week seven, but I've not been to the gym yet. I got up uh, about three o'clock and then went back to sleep because I'm tired. And I've just woke up, so I'm going to wait until the uh, gym is a bit quieter after school. So yes, uh, six full weeks and I'm starting to feel the benefits now. I was looking at some photos last night, so I've lost a lot of weight. My mum came around and she's like, bloody hell Neil, you've lost a lot of weight. So I have, I've lost a lot of weight. I've got my posture to sort out, need to keep my guts up in my chest because everything, everything was just totally destroyed. I could feel my body being destroyed by alcohol. So feeling a lot looser now, feeling just a lot better. My legs have always been quite strong. I've always had strong legs. But yeah, just feeling a lot looser now and uh, got my strength back and everything and uh, it's good. You know, and I'm doing this, it's like a holistic thing. I'm doing everything that I'm doing, I'm doing, well, might be so hard for some people to understand, but I'm doing it for God. It's like doing it for me, but I'm doing it for a higher purpose and I'm not... How to, do, how to put it, it's not, it's doing it for, you know, I, I have to put hard work in now. I've been lazy for too long and I was destroying my body for too long. I was talking to someone last night. I went to Sainsbury's on the way back. Yeah, I need to sort my abs out. I'm working on them. So, breathing in and <laughs> all that stuff. Posture, yeah, correct my posture. I've got to... Stand straight up like that instead of like slouching like this. <laughs> yeah, we're talking to this guy called John, and he were homeless. He were outside. Um, he were outside Sainsbury's, and to be honest, it's not for me to say. I don't think he had long left to go. He were like a skeleton. I could feel all his razor blades, uh, all his shoulder blades. I was talking to him for a bit and I bought him something to eat because I, I don't give him money now you know I've got I'm pretty sort of I've got my own sort of uh, it's just the way that I roll I don't give him money uh, I give him um, I'll give him something to eat and not all of them you can't feed all of them but if I can if I've got time I'll always make time to try and talk to him and this guy called John and he was blind in one eye I think he was going blind into the right. He was an alcoholic, he stank a drink. And um, I got him some Cornish pasties and there were no hot food. It were at that Sainsbury's on Ings Road. And they were, um, we were talking about alcohol and I told him, you know, that I've managed to get sober and I tried loads of times and he said, keep trying, John. And I, uh, I gave him a hug and his shoulder blades, he, he was like a skeleton. And I was saying, you know, you've got to eat and everything like that, you know, are you eating? And he said, no. He said, everything I get, I spend it on and drink. And uh, some people buy me food. He said, you've bought me some food. And he said, thank you. Because some of them say that they don't want food. You know, some of them are like, you know, they look a bit disappointed when they get food. And, um, and I know why. I know why. I would have rather have had drink than food. It's sad, it's it's awful. You're just killing yourself, you are. It's suicide, it is, it's committing suicide. And uh, he's like, oh, thank you, I am hungry. And uh, I got him like this mango drink thing. And uh, I was just like, fucking hell, because, you know, good luck this winter and everything. Have you got anywhere where you can go? And he says, yeah, the church lets us in if it's below freezing. Right, what the fuck's all that about? Anyway, the church let some of the church, one of the churches in Wakefield lets them in if it's below freezing. And then he goes, there's an hotel or something that lets some of them in, but he goes, it's a free for all. And uh, and, let, and, I'll, and I'll be on it, you know, I'm, I'm not bothered what people think. Some of them are fucking scumbags. They are, they're horrible. They're at the lowest of the low. They're at the lowest in the food chain and they're, um, they're like animalistic, they steal off each other, they, um, they rob and thieve, they're on drugs and stuff, and it makes people desperate. You know, and 
I I know you know when I were at my worst I I were like I, I it, it makes you into a monster it does and he says um, he doesn't like being around them you know that's why a lot of some of them when you speak to them they're on their own you know they don't want to hang around in big groups because in the big groups they're like a pack of fucking hyenas that all they're doing all the time is thinking about scoring and they just they're like predators they go around they call it grafting you know stealing for money and they'll steal off their own mothers they'll steal off anyone and he says um he says he, he doesn't hang around with those people and i'll be honest i'm not a doctor or anything i don't think he has long left to go and i i were like um under no illusions i nearly lost this flat i lost everything you know contact with my mum my mum didn't want to my mum couldn't speak i just lost everything and I was very close to being homeless. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate what happened to me. I managed to sort it out. And, you know, looking at photos of me yesterday, and I want, I, I, it were, I was just a bloating, how bloated I was. And uh, my eyes had gone dead. And uh, my skin, all my skin all over my body were just itching and uh, really dry. And because what it is, what alcohol does to me, what it did to me, it just rips all of the vitamins out of your body and everything. It just rips all the nutrients and everything out. And um, it's just fucking awful. And that was uh, 11 months ago, you know, at Christmas. Well, New Year in January. So I'm just starting to, you know, like with alcohol, uh, I'm over it now. I'm not craving it anymore. But I still sometimes do struggle mentally. You know, I do struggle mentally. I do. I look around and see people getting leathered. And, you know, for me, it is hard. Life is hard. It is. It, it hurts. It's painful. Um, you know, like... Uh, it is, it's hard, it's mentally quite hard sometimes, an easy thing. There's always this little, and I know what it is, it's a demon, always on my shoulder, just going, have a drink and it will all go away. Join the high, join the fucking big road, like what Jesus said, the wide boulevard that everyone else is on. Eat junk food, go out partying, go out shagging, you know, get a girlfriend, fucking... You know, it didn't work with that one. Well, get another one. Go out partying. Go out drinking. Go out, you know, spend your nights watching Netflix. Fucking this and that. All these different things. The thing that everyone else is doing. The wide boulevard. Don't don't work, don't be a Christian. That's fucking dumb. Jesus Christ, what the hell? You don't worship him. Worship Andrew Tate or something like that. <laughs> Become a Muslim or something like that. You know, it's like fucking the thing that everyone else is doing. You got friend zoned? Fuck that bitch. You need to man up. Yeah, treat that bitch like a fucking, you know, you, you know what I mean? It's like, you got yourself in the friend zone? Oh, you, are, you fucking simp. You know, what the fuck you playing at? Hang around with your fucking mates and your pals, yeah, and treat women like fucking shit. You know, just do the thing that everyone else is doing, and then you, you're in the club then, aren't you? And you're doing what everyone else is doing. And for me, it would be drinking and doing drugs. It would come along with it, because everyone else is doing it. Go back to the doctors and get on antidepressants. You know, submit to the authorities of the world. You know, oh, I'm feeling sad here, yeah, I'm depressed or whatever. I'll go to doctors and I'll get... You know, I could do all that because I've done it, right? And I understand what Jesus said. He goes, "My the path with me is the hard path. It's it's hard, and it hurts to be changed. To be because it's owning up that I want to change. I don't want to be that person that I used to be. And it's been born again, like the famous dialogue that Jesus has with that intellectual called Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees." And that man is embarrassed. To, he's like, well, I'll just say it. Uh, maybe he's like Jordan Peterson or someone like that. He's embarrassed to come and speak to Jesus 
when Jesus is speaking through the day when he's coming to the crowds because everyone else is there and this intellectual is embarrassed because he's like oh Jesus is really just for the poor people like Nietzsche said Christianity is for the slaves it's for the fucking lowest of the low it's to give them a little bit of confidence so they work a little bit harder Friedrich Nietzsche were a piece of scum you were a fucking asshole but it may look, maybe it's true why did Jesus only come to the downtrodden and the weak and this intellectual is embarrassed to be seen with Jesus in the daytime. So he comes and finds him at night on his own. And he's in disguise as well. He's like wearing a, well, it just says that he didn't want to be seen by his mates because it was embarrassing. And Nicodemus asked Jesus some, uh, some really deep questions. It's one of the longest dialogues in the gospel because he were an intellectual and he had a lot of serious questions for God. If this guy says he's God, well, has God got some answers to some deep questions? And he says, this thing that you're preaching about being born again, what do you mean about that? Like, seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you the question. It might be an embarrassing question for the scientists to ask and the intellectuals and the fucking, do you know what I mean? The, the professors, the people with PhDs. Jesus didn't have a PhD, did he? There were no such thing as a PhD in those days, but it's the same thing. He goes, what do you mean about that? He goes, we're all born once of woman. We're all, we all come out of a woman's body. You're born once into this world. Why, why, why do you always say that we need to be born twice? What do you mean by that? And Jesus said, verily I tell you the truth. Because he's not lying he never lied jesus never told lies not like everyone else everyone else lies we're all liars jesus said verily i tell you the truth everyone is born of woman born of the flesh but everybody if they're coming to the true father to my father in heaven through me everybody has to be born of the spirit and that's just the way that it has to be and Nicodemus is like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, well, listen to what I say. All the things that I've been teaching. What did he say? I don't want people to become worldly, religious people. I want them to become spiritual people. Reli the religious people were the ones who we were, like Nicodemus and, and St. Paul and all of them. Well, Paul was called Saul of Tarsus. All of the the Sanhedrin and the, the Jews at the time, the, the priests were all, quote unquote, religious people. People who pray out loud and they have, you know, incense and they walk around in fancy robes. And when the priest walks down the street, you all, you all go, oh, you're a priest and you like worship them. It's a power structure. And when you go into church, you're not allowed to swear and you're not allowed to speak and you're only allowed to speak at a certain time. And when you pray, you have to do it really loud because I don't want my followers who are following what I say to become like them. I don't want them to be religious people. I want them to be spiritual people. And the only way that they can become truly spiritual people is if they're born again of the spirit. And Nicodemus is like, well, what do you mean by that? And he goes, it means they're going to have to destroy themselves for what they were and be born again with me. And Nicodemus, I don't know much about him. I don't know if he became what a Christian after that. But I understand all of my heroes from that time, St. Paul is one of them mainly. They were all on a certain trajectory and they were all quote unquote a certain person and they all changed and became different people totally different people in a way that like physically and everything they say that saint paul not in the gospels but in the accounts uh, the other accounts because remember at the t once he converted right that was an epic event and it caused massive controversy and the jews at the time and the romans especially when christianity became illegal in ad 64 they blamed the christians for for burning rome to the ground and nero ordered every christian that were ever caught to be executed and killed and enslaved 
So they destroyed all the records. The Jews tried to wipe Christianity out. They tried to burn all the documents and everything, but some of them did survive. And they said that St. Paul was just a, a horrible man. He was, he was angry all the time. He was zealous. He was filled with this religious authority. I know best and you don't know shit. And, you know, lording it over people. And when he had the road, of, road to Damascus moment, he became totally different in the way that people didn't recognise him. His wife didn't recognise him. She was like, it's you, but it's not you. <laughs> His best friends were like, whoa. When he woke up, when it said the scales were lifted from his eyes, because he was knocked to the ground for nearly three days. He didn't eat for three days. He, they were trying to give him water. You don't eat and drink in that climate. Um, you'll die. He nearly died. And when he got up and woke up, he'd had some massive shock or whatever. And um, they said, uh, when he started talking, they were like, boss, are you okay? <laughs> what, what, why have you been so nice? <laughs> but it's not that he would have been a nice guy. He just totally, cha totally changed. And he dedicated the rest of his life to um, so that people like me and other people who are non-Jewish can read the gospel. If it weren't for St. Paul, the Jews would have had it so that no one had ever heard the name of Jesus Christ. They tried to suppress it and the Romans did too. So he said, I'm going all around the world to tell them the good news and I will die for it. And apparently, I was just I was reading about it. It was about sixty. It was AD sixty four when um, when Nero proclaimed Christianity to be illegal, and Paul would have been. Um, he was a little bit younger than Jesus, so Jesus was killed in AD thirty three, AD thirty two or thirty three. He was thirty three years old. And um, so Paul would have been at least 60 and some of the sources say that he was a bit older. But they said when he was brought to his famous show trial, when he was bought, brought to Cyprus and then uh, um, Sicily and then eventually to Rome, he was under house arrest for nearly two years while the Sanhedrin were compiling its um, case against him. And he, and he was a Roman citizen, so he had protection from Rome. He was living under house arrest and people could come and visit him. But he was not allowed to leave until the trial had taken place. And he knew he was going to be executed. And that's the year 64 when it became uh, to be a Christian. Someone who followed Jesus' teachings, it was illegal. And they, there were massive riots and Rome was burnt to the ground. And it's because Rome were collapsing. They blamed it on the Christians though. And they said that it was them who started the fire. So they started to kill a lot of top ones. And Paul was, Paul and St. Peter and St. Paul were probably the top two world renowned ones. And both of them were killed in Rome. And it says that when Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin, he looked old because 60 would have been old in those days. Most people were dead in the 30s or 40s. Most poor people were. You were lucky to live past 40. You'd have been classed as an old man. Paul came from a very wealthy family. He was from a dynasty called the Herodian dynasty. So King Herod was a relative of his. The, the same king who um, was um, in charge when Jesus was born. So he was from a wealthy family, uh, a dynasty, if you like. And um, so maybe he just had a, a different kind of life than poor people. Although when he converted to Christianity, he was poor. It, um, they said that he, was, he looked old. And it, some of the accounts say that he, he always used to shave his head. He always used to, like, for a religious rite, he used to shave his head really uh, completely bald and oil his head because it used to mean like in some cultures it you know it used to mean something it used to mean like the, the mohicans the tribes of mohicans in america used to do it it's like it means that you're going on a special mission usually to a war or something like that and it means 
you know, stay away from this person, don't talk to him, do you know what I mean? He's, he's preparing himself for like a spiritual thing. And Paul used to do that all the time. But one of the accounts said that he had long hair down to his shoulders and a beard. But it said that he was strong, he was muscular. And Nero was personally there. Nero was stood opposite him in his purple robes and everything. And um, it says that Nero was wearing all the spend splendor, the crown and the, the jewels and everything and the scepter of, of being the emperor. But Paul was just wearing more or less rags, but he, he looked like the king. You know, when you looked at him, his eyes were really pure and, he, and they had really, he had really powerful, a really powerful gaze. This woman who wrote an account of him, who knew him well, she said, I knew him before I, I, I he said who it was. There's a famous cave painting over in what is Turkey today, in near Constantinople. And she said, because they were all in hiding, everywhere they went, they were fucking persecuted. And she said there were a group of men, she knew about him because they'd been writing to each other, but she said there were a group of men walking up the hill and there were like four men or something. And she said, I knew instantly who Paul was. She said it was something to do with his eyes and he had grace about him. And uh, that's what the account said. Nero was sat there with all the worldly and splendor, you know, handmade fucking clothes and everything like that and all the jewels and everything and it was Paul who was in the rags who looked like the man of authority and he had this grace about him this peace you know and he, and he famously said you know I am going to die and I'm not bothered I'm not afraid I'm going to be strong my body is only here like a temple to be destroyed like Jesus said and uh, yeah, he was famously beheaded. And I'm not saying that's gonna to happen to me, but I'm just saying, Paul looked after his body as well. He used to fast all the time. And I don't eat, try not to eat sweets anymore. Um, I eat pretty healthy, eat like good food every day. Don't eat that much, just one meal a day sometimes. Depends what I'm doing. When I'm busy and working and that, I eat a little bit more, but I don't eat. I'm looking after my, and I'm only six week, uh, seven weeks in. So if I keep up this for the rest of my life, you know, and it's not about, you know, getting, it's not all about just my body, it's about everything else. And I'm sticking to this until the day I die, because the alternative, I've been there and I don't, I can't imagine now life without God and without this, um, without faith. I just can't. I was thinking about it yesterday. I was pretty low yesterday. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? Just do the same as everyone else. They don't look very happy to me. Every time I look around, everyone I speak to, everyone's anxious. Everyone's on antidepressants. Everyone's drinking. Everyone's doing drugs. Everyone's worrying and everything. I'm worrying too. Life is hard. But there's, there's only one person in history for me. And it's, there's only, it's Jesus. And, and his vo voice speaks to me now, 2,000 years later. Like literally, you know, it's as clear as, it's not a voice, but it's, it, it makes so much sense. He goes, do not worry about your life. And he's not speaking to anyone else. He's speaking to me. He's saying, don't worry about your life. He says, the birds of the air, he goes, they don't worry about their life. They don't store up treasure and buy big houses. They don't, they don't store their food in barns and reap and sow the field. And he goes, my, they don't do all these things. And my father feeds them because he loves them. Be like the birds. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about where you're going to live. Don't worry about your status. Just follow me. Like he said, that's just the most powerful thing ever. You know, anyone who's ever experienced it, that darkness, it's not necessarily, you know, like, like 
darkness, you know, like the 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 night time. It is like that, but it's like this darkness. It can be there in the full daylight, this darkness. I know exactly what he means by that. And there's millions of people in the world who know what it feels like as well. It's this negativity, it's this darkness. Jesus Christ. There were loads of philosophers who said loads of amazing things. People before him as well. Sun Tzu, people like that in China. Um, Buddha. He said amazing things as well. Um, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. But none of them said this. None of them said, I am the light of the world. Like, look at the sun. Some people have always, like, worshipped the sun. Or, like, a lot of people, it's trendy to do it now. Worshipping the universe. What are you going to do? <laughs> Worship some balls of gas. Because you know, it looks good from a distance. The, the stars and the constellations look good from a distance. But they're about four million light years apart. They're about four light years apart. The closest star is four light years away. You're never going to get to the thing. And when you do, you're going to melt. It's just a ball of gas. And they're just rocks. And it only looks good from a distance. But loads of people have, throughout history, since the dawn of man, have done that. They've worshipped the planets and they've worshipped the sun. Jesus says, I am the light. I am the light. It, scripture says that Satan is the light bearer. He is like the sun. And that's what it really is. Materialism. Satan is in charge of material things that you can touch. He's in charge of it all. He's been. He's just taken dominion of it. Lucifer in Latin means it's like it's kind of the sun, really. It's like the light. It's This is the harsh thing that some people uh, got confused about when Jesus was preaching. Jesus says, I am the light. I'm the th My father is the thing that made the light. He's, he is the light. And you go, what, like the light particles? And then you get too much light and you go blind. <laughs> He's like, no. <laughs> I am the light and the way. But that's looking at it in a material way, isn't it? Like a physical way. Now the light, when you're in the darkness, when you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling lost, when you're feeling lonely, when you're feeling despair, when you're worrying, or I'm not saying you, I'm saying me, when I'm feeling inadequate or insecure or afraid, like it says fear itself is, is demonic, being afraid. When you're feeling any of those things, the thing that is going to get you out of it is the is like it's, it's positive, whatever you want to call it, positivity, or confidence, or optimism, all these things. It's so hard to feel those things when you're down there, but it's the only thing that's going to save you. Jesus is the only one in history who says, "I am those things." That's what. That's why I think he got killed. Because it's, we all need this advice, and many people will say it, but no one has the temerity to say, it's me. Say my name. I get it, and it's worked for me. But it's hard to stay on the path, because it's almost like everything in this world. It's not like I'm paranoid or anything, but it goes against all worldly things, it does. You're going to follow a fucking... Him? <laughs> a sandal wearing guy with a beard? Who was peace loving? And all this stuff? <laughs> Preached about love? What was he, a pansy boy? You know, little do they know. They don't understand. They don't know Jesus. And so, like St. Paul, I, I worry about that, you know, oh, am I going to be 60 odd years old and, you know, cancer diagnosis? You know, it'll probably be a respiratory thing with me in hospital. You know, like my dad's suffering with it at COPD now, and I'm worried about that. And I'm like, I don't want to get old. I don't want to be old. You know what I mean? But that's just negative stinking thinking. 
St. Paul said, and David Bowie, one of my heroes, David Bowie said this in an interview when he got sober. He said, I don't really think about tomorrow very much. And I never think about yesterday. Because they were asking him about our, his new album. And he said, uh, one of his old albums. And he said, I don't really think about it. He said, I see that I've got 24 hours. And it, apparently David Bowie didn't sleep much. Most people who are like that who are... Uh, He's a former cocaine addict, the, the right kind of hyper. The reason why they gravitate towards cocaine is because, and amphetamines is because it, it heightens that. Donald Trump, he, he only gets about three hours sleep a night. He's a really like, always, he, he wait, Donald Trump says the same thing. I see the day about how much I can cram in. He's one of the hardest working people in the world. Look at that man, he's nearly 80 years old. He did four rallies the other day. Joe Biden would have been taken to an hospital in a stretcher. And I'm not here to talk about Donald Trump. I'm just here I'm about his politics. I don't agree with most of it. But as a human being, he's incredible. It's like these people, they're super... They're not lazy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They're, they're like super productive. David Bowie, he just said, I, um, I can't cram enough into a day. The devil makes work for idle hands. Keep busy and make sure that the things that you are doing are good, positive things. David Bowie says, he said, everything I do, I think about how will it affect my family now. He said, I never used to think about that. And that's the reason why he probably didn't talk about the old albums. Ziggy Stardust and um, Aladdin Sane and things like that. He said, I don't really talk about them because I were an awful person when I wrote those fucking albums. He said, now my son, and uh, well, he's got two sons, hasn't he? Oh, he's dead now, but it doesn't matter. He said, my family, my wife and everything means everything to me. So when I write an album, I'm thinking about them. He had love in his life, didn't he? And it's all about understanding what love is. And love consumes your day. Like I see it with Donald Trump. Like he says, he says every day uh, I say to Melania, she cries all the time. She's she's convinced her husband is going to get killed. They wanted his head to explode on high definition camera when that guy tried to shoot him. They wanted that so that there's millions of people in this world who would just be just they'd just be eating their McDonald's going, yes, watching his head explode. And that bullet missed because he turned his head around. It's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. Because there were people who wanted him to die, and his wife knows it. Not only that, they wanted to see Donald Trump's head explode on high definition camera, because that camera was looking right at him. <coughs> They had it all set up so that the world could watch that man's head explode like a watermelon <coughs> and it missed and Melania says she cries every day because she really loves him and he loves her and he says I love you and if I don't make it today at least I love you that's what it's all about folks I'm not fucking saying <laughs> mention his name It'll trigger most people. I'm not interested in politics. I'm just saying as a person. And that's what Jesus is like. He's like, your life is for living and doing good deeds. And there'll be a lot of people who hate you and they'll try to turn you down. Or turn they'll try to tear you down. And they'll and they'll they'll that's they'll try to make it like that man I, John I saw last night. He might have had his own reasons for being there. I mean, he started going, oh, if I were from somewhere else, I'd have been given a, an hotel room and all this. And he's, yeah, feeling sorry for himself and stuff. But look at him. He's, you know, people just walking past him. All this money getting sent. All, all like this government. It's like, what the fuck? There's veterans on the street and there's, you know, all these uh, homelessness problems got worse and it's like, and that's the thing that I always try to get to him. I'm like, look, the world don't care about you, buddy. People don't give a fucking shit. The government certainly doesn't give a shit. So you've got to, you've got to find it in yourself. And it's almost impossible. That's why so many people die. I, I, I were like that. I was waiting for some magician, some person to come along and no one did. It was Jesus for me. So I understand it's a miracle. I was looking at photos last night and I, I, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I couldn't. I was ashamed of what I saw. 
I felt like a failure for my family because I come from a family of tough people and uh, I felt like uh, not even worthy to have my name. I felt ashamed, but I don't feel that way anymore and Jesus, that's because of Jesus. And in the meantime, you know, I still got some weight to lose around here, got my posture to sort out, but I'm getting my strength back in my hands. When I was riding my BMX the other day, you know, my legs have always been strong because I always walk, you know, pretty far. But when I were, went to skate park the other day, you know, I just felt like, yeah, it felt like I was 20 years old again. And I'm 42 or 41, 42 in a few weeks. And I'm like, it's just amazing, it's a miracle. And all I've got to do is just keep thinking those negative, that, 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 just fall back into that darkness and it'll all go away and it'll all be worthless, it'll all be awful. So it's about staying positive. And yesterday was pretty bad, I was pretty tired and everything. But there's a new day today and got up early, I like going to the gym and I'm like, oh, <coughs> I must have fallen back asleep. But I'm going to go now. So it's week seven, day one. <coughs> I've not been to the gym for six days. I'm going to try go every day now. I'm going to try do a bit every day. And it's not the gym that's going to save my life. And it's not having an healthy body. It's going to save my life. It's a, whole, a, 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 a holistic thing. It's many things. But there's nothing wrong with being able to look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm pretty impressed with what I see. Because it's not exalting myself anymore. It's, it's just been realistic and understanding where I was and where I could easily go back to. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I saw that guy, John, last night and I was like, it's hard to know what to say, isn't it? And I never talk down to these people. Sometimes people say it's a bit harsh, you know, sometimes. You know, I've got certain rules that I'll never give them money. Um, I just won't do it. I'll buy them something to eat, but I am not going to enable them to drink themselves to death. And I won't. Sometimes I'll walk past some of them. I'm like, I can't feed them all. It's not my. I'm, I'm skint. I am. I'm struggling with money. I've got a son to think of, and you know, I've got. Um, I understand that when you get to know some of them as people, they're not very nice people. Because I wasn't a very nice person either. But some of them are, they want to change. And uh, I could see it with him. And it's like, uh, you know, how much longer has he got left? You know, he was just skin and bone. I felt his shoulder blades and it was like, fucking hell, dude. Like, when was the last time you were it? He said a few days ago. This drinks, he stank of it. Now, like saying all the stuff, you know, it's that thing about keeping it at bay. You know, you don't want to go into a seizure, so you need to drink a certain amount to stay functioning. But it's getting drunk that you shouldn't do. It always gets carried away. That's what I went through with the drink diaries. It was just drinking like a, t a tinny just to feel okay and then wait another hour and then when shakes start to come drink another. But I couldn't do that. I'd start drinking and I'd feel good and then I'd get drunk and it was the same cycle all the time. And that's what he said. He goes, ah, yeah, because it's the same every day, old pal. And, um, you know, obviously there'll be some people going, ah, oh, they're living on the streets, but they've got enough money to drink. You don't understand. They're drinking to live. I feel so sorry for him. And, um, you know, I was speaking to him last night and I came away thinking, that fella ain't got long to go. I don't think he'll be here next year. You know, all he's got to do is get pneumonia and he's dead. Because his body didn't look very strong to me. And that's what it's about. St. Paul was homeless most of the time. He spent a lot of his time in prison. He was fucking shipwrecked, <laughs> stoned, flogged. He was always in trouble everywhere he went, lynched, kicked out of every city. But he always looked after his body. 
he didn't um, he wasn't drinking himself to death I don't think he even touched alcohol at the end and he lived to be 64 and it, it said he was not very tall not a tall man but he was wiry and he had muscles and he didn't look his age because he was an old man it says he was at least 60 but some of the sources say we're older all of the Jewish sources were all fucking burnt and the Romans but they refer to them these sources that no one's ever found in the desert but the desert coughs up things all the time you know they'll find stuff because his show trial was a massive thing it was a huge show trial and uh, famous all around the Roman world but they tried to suppress it all because Nero proclaimed all Christians to be the lowest form of dogs and scum and uh, it said he was old and he looked tired because he'd had a hard life but he said it says that the, these, his eyes shone like diamonds and he had this fire inside him and Nero was sat opposite him because Nero wanted to personally be there because he knew how important Paul was Nero probably had his head brought to him like they did to St John because Paul was beheaded St Peter was crucified upside down well, they don't know. They know that Paul was beheaded and Paul uh, was stood in the dock or whatever opposite Nero. And Nero were there in all his regalia, all his finery. And some people were like looking going, is that guy in fancy dress? Because he looks like the fucking king to me. We're going to be talking about that guy for a long time. You know, in 2000, 2000 years ago, and people are still... I, I talk about... I think about St. Paul all the time. I was praying to him last night. Is anyone praying to Nero so that they can be like him? Paul had the temerity to say it. He said it to their faces. He goes, no one will be talking about you. Everyone throughout the ages will always be talking about Jesus. Little children, when they feel lost, and old men and women when they're alone and crying and afraid they'll speak to him and they'll feel strong no one's going to be calling on your name Nero so I get it and uh, I don't want to be an old man <laughs> but if I am you know it's only six weeks into it this is week seven where will I be in another year because I've said two years I'm going to, I'm going to do what Dave Cameron said Two years of my life, I'm nearly a year into it now, and then another year, and then look at myself honestly in the mirror and say, am I in a better place, spiritually, mentally, and physically, um, or not? And if I'm not, we can always go back to my old ways and join the crowd, join the big boulevard that everyone else is on. But I'll always have that voice on my other shoulder, not on my shoulder anymore. The demon will be on my shoulder. Jesus is in me now. And Jesus said loud and clear, don't go onto the big wide path that everyone else is on. With the big flashing lights and the loud music and the spiritual, oh yeah, everything's awesome. And the butt plugs and the fucking, <laughs> the sex toys and the fucking Netflix series and the McDonald's and the fancy holidays every year and the big house and the Ferrari and the, you got friends owned, well fuck that bitch and all this fucking scientific knowledge and all this, uh, all this positivity and uh, power of the universe and yeah, the big wide road that everyone else is on and the, way, the gate is wide and it's all inclusive and everyone comes, you can come from another country on a boat and they'll just give you a hotel room and all this lot and then look at that guy, yeah, it's that road, that big road, yeah. Donald Trump's going to save the world or Donald Trump, no, he's evil, we want him to die. You know, that road that everyone else is on that's just crammed and it's all fun, it's got luminous neon lights and LED lights and everything like that. Jesus says that road leads to destruction. The road that I'm on is lonely and the gate is narrow and it's a stony path and it's scary and it's dark and you find it, you're struggling to find your way and the gate is narrow, it's thin 
and like I, I always think you know maybe it's like an old ancient wrought iron gate that's like a skew and there's weeds all around it and an old church like a ruin maybe and you've got to it's dark and at night and it's cold and you've got to smash that gate open and you get in there's all the old grit he says that's where I am they were taken out of the Gospels but they found it in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Gnostic Gospels the Gnostic Christians they said they heard him say in one of his sermons do not go looking for me in cathedrals and buildings of stone and wood you will t lift up a stone and you will find me break open the piece of wood and there I'll be not necessarily in the places where everyone else is looking for him I find him a lot on my own in places everyone finds him the way that they find him <laughs> and it's just everyone's journey but he does say the same thing for all of us he said it's not an easy road it's the hard road but he said that road leads to me and what did he say about himself he said I am the light and the way in this world he who follows me will never walk in darkness and they're the most powerful words that any human being has ever said in my opinion kind of arrogant for someone to say that Jordan Peterson doesn't say that does he? he says a lot of awesome things but Jordan Peterson doesn't say buy my book and follow me because I am the light they did kill him Jordan Peterson wouldn't last two minutes he'd be mocked and ridiculed just the same way that Jesus was but there was something else about Jesus wasn't there I am the light of this world he who follows me will never walk in darkness but have the light of life look after your body your body is a temple right and the temple will be destroyed <laughs> It's there, look. That photo was captured in one take, and that little boy was going, Daddy, why didn't you get one of these? I'm going, Alex, is that bubblegum? He's going, yeah. And then I just, I just did a selfie. We got to church and we got the light. Is it the sun? Am I going to worship the sun? No. I'm going to worship the twinkle in that little boy's eyes and the smile on my face. And I see it everywhere now. See it in places I never thought I'd see it. Jesus is everywhere. He's in the smiles. He's in the tears of joy. And I just got to keep thinking about that. Ask him. He understood. Didn't you, maestro? But he used to get angry about it all the time. But you listen to his music and you know, he knew it too. <laughs> Maybe you could get, that's the problem, isn't it? Most of us who get it are pretty fucked up people. Like St. Paul said, I get this. Some people might not get it, but I do. Because I was the worst of the worst. It's for bad people, really. Fucked up people. Everyone else is fine. They're okay. They don't need it. <laughs> like St. Paul said, he goes, I was a sinner. And he goes, I was the worst of the worst. I used to send men out to kill. I used to enjoy doing it. I should have known better. Jordan Peterson's done an old lecture on it. Intelligent people, clever people, because they can be the worst. They can. Just because you've got a high IQ, clown world might like it. Oh, high IQ people are the greatest. No, not necessarily. What happens if you're bad? You can come up with real amazing ways to destroy the world and to destroy other people. Some of the smartest people in the world invented the fucking atom bomb. They split the atom, didn't they? Intelligence has got very little to do with it. Actually, it can be worse. It says in the Bible, doesn't it? Ignorance is bliss. I look at some people and, you know, I wish... I, I said it in rehab, I was like, oh, give me a lobotomy or something, thinking too much. But I don't feel that way anymore. I am pretty intelligent, but I'm not using it towards evil 
ends anymore. I'm, and I never really was, but I, I was doing. I, I was just a just a shit life, fucking shit. I were unhappy. So yeah, Jordan Peterson says that. He goes, watch out for those intelligent people. If you've got an IQ of one hundred and twenty, watch that person. They, they might make doctors and things like that, but who gives a shit? Joseph Mengele was a fucking doctor, wasn't he? Doctor Goebbels. Do you know what I mean? Look at some of those doctors in America now, cutting genitals off children and stuff. Doesn't mean anything about being a good person, having an IQ. Doesn't mean jack shit. I've got an uh, an IQ hundred and sixteen, hundred hundred and twenty. I could uh, I could go to university. Don't, it's not going to make me. It's not going to do anything, is it? Over and out, I'm going to the gym. I've got a day's work tomorrow and I'm losing a bit of weight. I'm getting a bit, I've got to get my guts up into there. Got to lose my men boobs, got to work on them, got to be patient. Apparently that goes last. So turning up a little bit, but I'm six weeks into it and I'm thinking about years, folks. I'm thinking about, you know, fucking 20 years down the line. I don't want to be an old, I don't know, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking I don't want to be like Paul. I think he said he'd had enough as well. He's like, are you living each day so that you die? And he's like, kind of. <laughs> you know, carpe diem. That's a, a Roman saying, isn't it? Seize the day. In Gladiator, they made Gladiator 2 now. I don't think I'll be going to see it because Ridley Scott's fucking lost the plot. But he's one of my favourite directors. Of Farmer, he's not a good anymore. I don't like him anymore. But the original Gladiator with Russell Crowe, what does he say to all the soldiers before they go into battle against the barbarian horde, the Germans? <laughs> before the, the, the Wehrmacht. He says, what we do in life echoes in. Something like that. Anyway, I'm going to the gym now, over and out. The results of week six, I've only been going week six and I've been sober for 11 months. And um, it's, it's nothing, it's like uh, I'm a baby. I've got a long way to go, over and out.